Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president here at CSIS, and we have a rare opportunity today. We're going to have a conversation with Richard Koo. Um, Richard Koo is famous uh, for inventing you know, macroeconomic concepts which are now really unfolding all around us, and we're going to explore that today. And we're also going to talk about his latest book, which is called Pursued Economy. It's an unusual term, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to get into that. Uh, uh, Richard is a chief economist for Nomura. He, um, he's uh, from Taiwan originally, he's lived in the United States. He was, he was the New York Fed, as I recall, and what did you, uh, born in Japan. Uh, has, his father was an industrialist in, in Taiwan. Uh, travels frequently to China, so he's a real expert, and we're going to draw on all of that today. Uh, and I look forward to the conversation. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. I, I, I'd like to begin, actually, with a book that you wrote earlier, about 20 years ago, I think, and you created the concept of a balance sheet recession. You know, and it's, you know, for a political scientist like me, I. I, I struggled to understand, to help, to help our audience understand what is a balance sheet recession? Okay. Well, my undergraduate major was also a medical science, so we are not that far. <laughs> uh, I was in Japan in early, well, I, I've been in Japan since 1984 when I was headhunted from the New York Fed to work in Nomura. I was supposed to leave in two years and go back to the Fed, but I got stuck there. Then the bubble burst as the prices start collapsing, and the Japanese economy lost all that uh, momentum it had before. Remember how powerful Japanese companies were in the 80s and early 90s. And the Bank of Japan brought rates down to zero, fiscal stimulus, all sorts of policies were tried. Nothing was working. And my economics trading said, if you bring rates down to zero, something should happen. But nothing was happening. And so we were all lost. Then around 1997, I happened to produce a chart, which shocked me. And the chart is, we stood on the slide. Yeah, could you put up the charts, please, for Mr. Koo? There we go. This chart shows what, how much money Japanese companies have been procuring borrowing from the market, both capital market and the uh, Abengia system. And if you look at the, the middle of it, the numbers are actually below zero. Below zero means these big guys are paying down debt. And this chart also shows, shows the level of interest rates. Rates rates are down to zero, and companies were paying down debt. And we never learned this in business schools, right? Companies are not supposed to pay down debt when interest rates are zero. But that's what was happening in Japan for like 15 years. And I had to think, why, why would companies be, why would companies would do something like this? And then came to the realization that their balance sheets must be in trouble. That their financial conditions are not very good. And that's easy to imagine because during the bubble, people borrowed lots of money to leverage themselves up so that they, make, they can make tons of money. Once the bubble burst, asset prices collapse, liabilities remain, this gap is the hole in your balance sheets. Many of them are technically bankrupt. Now, bankruptcy, <clears throat> excuse me, have two possibilities, one with cash flow and one without cash flow. Mm -hmm. If you have no cash flow and your balance sheet is underwater, you're bankrupt, period. You have to leave the sea. Uh, that's the end of the story. But suppose you still have cash flow, but your balance sheet is underwater because you made some lousy investments. And that was the case for most Japanese companies at that period. Remember, Japan was still selling cars and cameras all around the world. Everybody wanted to buy Japanese products, high quality, and so forth. So they had cash flow, but balance sheets underwater. When you're in that situation, what are you supposed to do? It doesn't matter whether you're Japanese, or American, or German, or Taiwanese. You're supposed to use the cash flow to pay down debt. Because as long as you have a cash flow, you can continue to pay down debt. At some point, your balance sheets will be balanced again. And from that point, you can say, oh, I'm out of this mess. I'm going to start making money again. But during this process, you're actually minimizing debt. And you want to do this because you don't want to tell your shareholders, sorry, your shares are a piece of paper now. 
You don't want to tell your bankers it's all non-performing loans, and most importantly, you don't want to tell your workers you have no more jobs tomorrow. So for all the stakeholders involved, that is the right thing to do. The problem is when everybody does it all at the same time, what happens? In a national economy, if someone is saving money or paying down debt, someone else has to be borrowing and spending money. And in the usual economy, people like us in the financial sector will take the money from the savers, give it to someone who can use it. Too many borrowers, central bank will raise interest rates. Too few borrowers, rates are lowered. That's how the cycle is maintained. That's the usual textbook economy. But once the nationwide asset price bubble, uh, <coughs> asset bubble bursts, everybody's paying down debt. No one is borrowing money, even at zero interest rates. And that's what this chart shows. So once you're in that situation, your ordinary economics, I'm afraid, goes out of the window because people are no longer maximizing profit. Mm. They're actually minimizing debt. And if you remember economics in your university days, they're all based on this key assumption that the private sector is maximizing profits. Then all the theories are built on top of it. But when you're in this situation, private sector is minimizing debt, then you have to replace everything that was top, on top of that because the implications are so very different. And one of the key, uh, so that was how it happened to Japan. And then if you look at the United States, this is the housing up. And if you look at, this is the household sector in the United States. Uh, and the, the blue vase in this chart shows how much uh, financial assets they increased. So the bubble burst in 2008. Right. Right, okay. And orange bars going down south means they're increasing their borrowings. So this chart shows that during the housing bubble, household sector in the United States were borrowing like crazy. They're actually below zero. The net number is below zero. Household sector is supposed to save money and the corporate sector is supposed to borrow money in the usual economy, right? But during the bubble days, the US household sector actually borrowing money on a net basis. But once the bubble burst, you see a big change in their behavior. Suddenly, even at zero interest rates, the uh, chairman began to brought rates down to zero very quickly, about like you know, almost five to 10 years. Americans just refused to borrow because their balance sheets are underwater and they're saving like crazy because they're trying to uh, repair their balance sheets. So it, this happened in Japan in 1990, but then 2008, it happened in the United States and Europe as well. So well, yeah. this is what happened to Spanish households in mm. the same period uh, because Europe also had a huge housing bubble as well, not just the United States. And the worst one is Ireland, this one. Irish bubble was the biggest in Europe, and you can see why. The people borrowed like crazy due, during the bubble days. And after that, even with zero negative interest rates, they're not borrowing money at all. So that's basically what I call balance sheet recession. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens when people stop borrowing money? We fall into a, a deflationary spiral in the following way. If I have $1,000 of income, and I spend 900 myself, the 900 is already someone else's income, so that's not a problem. The $100 I say will go through the financial sector, give it to someone who can use it, that it, when that person borrows and spends the $100, that together with my $900, this guy spends $100, together $1,000 against my original income of $1,000, the economy moves forward. Too many borrowers, rates are raised, too few borrowers, rates are lower to make sure the cycle is maintained. But when you fall into balance sheet recession, in the situation that you saw in these charts, you bring rates down to zero, it's still no borrowers. Everybody's repairing balance sheets. Then I have $1,000 of income, I still spend 900 myself. The 900 is already someone else's income, so that's not a problem. But the $100 time saved gets stuck in a financial system. It cannot go out because there are no borrowers. So only $900 is spent. With that $900 is someone else's income. If that person says, okay, let's save 10%, spend 900, uh, $810, and $90 comes into the banking system, it gets stuck there too. Because repairing balance sheets takes a long time to repair. To repair balance sheets takes a long time. So if nothing is done to the situation, the economy could go from 1,900, 810, 700. It contracts. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what happened to, uh, to the United States during the Great Depression. In four years, the United States lost 46% of its GDP. And their plunder, they're going to sky high, 25, 25% or so. 
that's that's the danger of this balance sheet recession. Mm -hmm. So that suggests that when there is a balance sheet recession, monetary policy disappears. Yeah. We have to put a new mic on you here real quick. That, that suggests that monetary policy becomes ineffective and that only fiscal policy is effective for a government? I'm afraid that is the case. Uh, because if no one is borrowing money, monetary policy is largely ineffective. Just bringing rates down to zero, you're just transferring uh, wealth from debtors to creditors, or in other cases, creditors to debtors. That's what interest rate moves uh, do. But for that to really have an impact on the economy, someone has to adjust their borrowing and spending. Mm -hmm. Higher rates, they reduce their spending. Uh, lower rates, they increase their spending. It, it's that part that affects the economy. But when there are no borrowers, you bring rates down to zero, negative rates, nothing happens. And the, not, the amount of bar, the disappearance of borrowers you can see in this chart. This chart shows three lines at the top. Uh, red line is amount of reserves. Federal Reserve injected into the system. So that's basically the money printing that we all talk about. The blue line is money supply. That's how much money we have in our bank account. And the green line is how much money banks lent. And if you remember your economics, we will talk that these three lines are supposed to move together. Right? So the central bank increases the public debt base by 10%, money supply credit increasing by 10%. And if you look at this chart, that world did exist until 2008. Three lines were moving beautifully together. Then the Lehman crisis happens. The Chairman Bernanke does the QE1, QE2, QE3, increasing the monetary base massively, almost 400%. But look what ha happens to the other two. The blue line stays put. Green line actually contracts. And why is the green line contracting? Because people are paying down debt. So that shows that this decoupling means that monetary policy, as you suggest, so, that is completely uh, made ineffective. So this explains why, even though we were printing money like yes. crazy over the last 15 years, right. inflation was low. Right. The, the bottom line is the inflation number. Yeah. And I watched this green line very carefully because that's how much money the banks actually lent out. You know, central bank can always put money into the banking system. That's not a problem. You just buy the assets from the banking sector and then you put the cash in, uh, on its place. But for the money to come out of the banking system and enter the real economy, banks have to lend money. You cannot mm -hmm. give this away because the money actually belongs to depositors. But if the banks are unable to lend, as these lines show, the green lines show, then all the money that our central bank put into the banking system is basically still stuck in the financial sector. It hasn't come out yet. And in that situation, I'm afraid monetary policy is largely useless. Mm -hmm. Government has to come in to borrow the excess savings in the private sector and put back into the income. So, so, the, so the, the, the Great Recession in the U.S. was brutal. But, it, but in Japan, it, it lasted two decades. What, why did it last so long in Japan? Did they, did they not adopt the right policies for fiscal stimulus to replace you know, the, 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 the excess savings in the private sector? Okay, uh, sorry, let me just move quickly these jobs. This is what happened to Eurozone, exactly yep. the same story, decoupling. UK, same decoupling story. And then finally, this is what happened to Japan. Same decoupling. Uh, but at the beginning, we had no idea what was happening. So they tried monetary policy, bringing rates down to zero, uh, fiscal policy. But fiscal policy always works. If the government spends the money, the $100, borrows and spends the $100, then it's $900 plus $100,000, the, the economy would be okay. And Japanese GDP, by the way, never fell below the peak of the bubble. Mm. It was always about the peak of the bubble, even though the amount of wealth Japanese lost as a result of bursting of the bubble was three years worth of 1989 GDP. Mm. The amount of wealth Americans lost during the Great Depression was one year's worth of 1929 GDP. So Japanese damage was three times larger. In the U.S., as I mentioned to you earlier, lost 46% of the GDP. Japanese never lost it, never lost anything. 
the GDP always stayed above the bubble and peak. Mm-hmm. And that's because the government was borrowing and spending. So it was working. It was working very well. But it was not perceived that way for, th- for the reason that we were all taught in our universities that there's always this pump priming idea. The fiscal policy, you do a big fiscal stimulus, and then that will <clears throat> pump the prime, economies start taking off, and then you can remove the fiscal stimulus. That's basically the whole idea of pump priming. That never worked. It doesn't work. Didn't yeah. work at all. And why is that? At the beginning, we had no idea why it wasn't working. But once you understand the balance sheet issues, then you can understand why. Mm-hmm. I mean, private sector thoughts experienced this massive loss of wealth. Commercial real estate in Japan fell 87% mm-hmm. nationwide. Mm-hmm. We just imagine that's happening in the United States, not just a little corner of Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. The entire country down 87. Everybody will be repairing balance sheets for years. So each year, fiscal stimulus was put in, everything worked, uh, economy responded. But when the re- it was removed, economy tanked again. And then people somehow concluded that, oh, then it's not working. It was working to keep the GDP from collapsing. But people didn't appreciate that. So they tried to do structural reforms, this and that. And we wasted lots of time. If we understood that this is a balance sheet recession from the very beginning, they would have put in a great uh, public works projects in place for five, 10 years until uh, we are completely out. Everything healed up. Yes. But, be, but can, I, can I, obviously everybody here in the audience here in the room and on, our virtual audience now wants to ask you about China. Uh, it kind of looks like China is on the front end of a balance sheet recession. Um, what do you think? Well, uh, I think it is entering one. I made a speech two months ago. I didn't think it was, uh, because I was, have to be very careful speaking about China these days, but it was leaked and it went absolutely viral in China. Millions of people have seen it. And so I've been getting a lot of requests to go over there and give a speech on balance sheet recession in China. The Chinese asset prices have gone sky high. And then it is, it is coming down. So let me just uh, jump a few charts. This is what happened to uh, Beijing house prices compared to what happened to Osaka and Tokyo house prices 30 years earlier. And even though the pattern is different, the, uh, the magnitude is the same. And now many people in China are saying, this cannot go on. And if you think the prices won't go up any higher, the time to get out is now, right? And so I'm hearing that a lot of Chinese households are paying down debt. Even though banks are trying to lend money, they are refusing to borrow. They're actually paying down debt. And that suggests to me that balance sheet is already on its way. Now, in the Japanese case, it actually took the sharp fall in asset prices to kind of make people realize that, oh my gosh, we have to uh, pay down debt to, to repair the balance sheets. And that happened because Japan never experienced uh, falling commercial real estate prices for the previous 40, 50 years. So they, when the initial falling uh, prices happened, a lot of people said, oh, this is just a temporary correction. It has to go up further. So they didn't take any action for like one or two years. And then when they realized that they were actually chasing wrong asset prices, then everybody started paying down debt, as you saw in that chart. In the Chinese case, they actually experienced one. You know, late 1990, there was one uh, incident where Chinese asset prices did fall. And so I think Chinese are a lot more sensitive to these issues than the Japanese were 30 years ago. And so whenever they, when they begin to see that the bubble is bursting, even if the government is able to maintain the price for a short, in a short run, if the prospect of further rise is, is not in the cards, and if you're one of those who are exposed to this risk, I, I'll be the first one to start paying down debt before it's too late, or you know, I'll sell the assets while the prices are still high. But when everybody starts doing that all at the same time, we enter balance sheet recession. Mm. And I think we are uh, moving in, in that direction. But this balance sheet recession, I have to struggle to say that right now, <laughs> um, is right on top of a pivot point on their, their population. 
I mean, they're, they have a demography problem now. Right, right. How, how are these going to be, how will they be connected? How does this affect each other? Well, uh, on the balance sheet side, balance sheet recession side, I think they have a huge advantage over the Japanese because they already saw what happened to Japan. And my books have sold very well in China for the last 15 years. So a lot of people are already aware of this concept of balance sheet recession. That's why it mm -hmm. was such a big response uh, to, to my uh, speeches. So they don't have to waste this 10, 15 years trying to figure out what was happening. They can just go and do whatever that's necessary fiscal stimulus to stop this thing from affecting the GDP. And people will be still paying down debt. But as long as you do the proper fiscal stimulus, GDP can be maintained and the economy could still move forward. That's basically what Japan proved. But the population part, uh, a lot of people you know, put Japanese economic slowdown with a uh, uh, population decline in Japan. But Japanese population did not decline until 2009, as this part chart shows. 2009 is 19 years after the bursting of the bubble in Japan. So that 19 years, Japanese population is still growing. You cannot explain the Japanese stagnation with population arguments. It was a balance sheet argument, not a population argument. But in the Chinese case, as you can see here, it's happening on the same year. The bursting of the bubble and the population decline happening on the same year. I'm sure that will make life quite difficult for the policymakers mm -hmm. as well as for the average Chinese. Mm -hmm. Because if the population is declining, the whole idea that real estate prices will continue to go up will not sound very realistic. But if people start inter not internalizing that and realize that, wow, maybe housing prices is peak at the, at right now, you better sell right now before it's too late, then that adds to the balance sheet problems uh, that Chinese would be, would be faced with. So population decline happening on the same year, I think, is a... This is a bigger problem. Yes, yes, um, yes. Could I, you know, every economy macro, from a macro standpoint, it has, of course, private consumption. You've got company investment, corporate investment. You get government spending, and then you get exports. Right. China has always had pretty weak private consumption, and now it, they're pulling back. Does this, what about the corporate side? I, I think I read something that you showed that, so corporate borrowing was declining in China. Right. Uh, that's, in my view, the most disturbing part of the Chinese economy. Mm -hmm. And this chart shows who borrowed money and who saved money in Japan. So there's a horizontal line going across zero. Above zero, the people saving money. Below zero are the people who are borrowing money. And there are four lines here, household sector, corporate sector, rest of the world, that's export and imports, and the government, government sector. And these four lines are supposed to add up to zero. That's how these things are put together. And if you look at the household line, the red line at the top, Chinese has been very consistent savers, something close to 10% of GDP. They're very <coughs> uh, responsible yeah. households, yeah. preparing themselves for whatever uh, things that could happen in the future. And the corporate sector was borrowing money, that's the blue line, until 2016 or so. And then after 2016, as, as showing that uh, circled area, uh, corporate sector start reducing their borrowings. Now, what happened? That's the question, because during this period, China was still- this one. China was booming. Booming, export was doing very well, Chinese are coming up with very uh, competitive products kept on running huge uh, trade surplus surpluses. That's not the situation where company should be reducing their borrowings. They should be increasing their borrowings because if you look at the same period in Japan or Taiwan or South Korea, they're all borrowing money to expand their business because they know they can make a lot of money with the kind of products they have. And the China have the, the quality products, uh, competitive products, and yet the companies are not borrowing money. And this is happening before the bursting of the bubble. If this happens after bursting of the bubble, as in Japan, that's perfectly understandable. But this is happening before the bursting of the bubble. Hmm. And because it was so bad, 
you can see the green line going down. That's, green line that's is the government down. spending. And yes. it goes down, that means bigger deficits. Exactly. So government realized that uh, private sector is not borrowing money. So someone has to borrow money to, to keep the economy going. If someone saves money, someone has to borrow money. So government took that role. Our regional governments did all sorts of things to keep the economy from collapsing. But that means before balance sheet recession uh, happens, they are already in very bit, uh, bad fiscal condition. That number is uh, close to almost 9% of GDP. And many regional governments are close to, to bankrupt. Uh, they depleted their borrowing resources and so forth. But, but if, if I understood your, your previous point that now they're entering a balance sheet recession, the government has to spend more money. Exactly. If, because as the private sector is saving, corporations are saving, now the government has to spend more money. But they've been doing that for eight years. Right. They've already built about as many Shinkansen rapid rail lines as you can build. Uh, what are they going to do? What, how, how do they get productive fiscal stimulus at this stage, given all of the debt that they've put in, in over the last, say, 10 years? Well, uh, there are a number of issues involved here. First of all, most of the fiscal stimulus in, the, in China over the last seven, eight years were done by the regional governments. And the regional, go regional governments have completely exhausted their borrowing power. So the central government will have to come in and borrow, or central government will have to guarantee mm -hmm. the activities mm -hmm. of the regional governments. One of those things will have to happen. Mm -hmm. will have to happen. Yeah. And that's something new for China, because in the past, it was the central government that just ordered the regional governments to do the borrowing and spending. But now the go central government will have to be involved in it. So that's one thing that they have to do, a lot of uh, regulatory and other changes. The other factor is, at the most fundamental level, financing of balance sheet recession should not be a problem. Because the balance sheet, problem, balance sheet recession happens because of excess savings in the private sector, the $100. So the $100 should be available in the financial sector. If the government comes in and borrow, it should, they should be more than happy to lend to the government. And we can already see that in the Chinese setting. Our 10 years Chinese government bonds is yielding only 2.6%. For an economy with that much forward momentum, exports so competitive, um, that's like Chinese writing in a huge mm -hmm. trade surplus mm -hmm. around the world, 10-year Gov government bond yield at 2.6% is ridiculously low. And that's because the private sector is not borrowing money. So all the fund managers, the people in my industry, who have to find a place to put these money to invest. Well, the companies are not borrowing money, so you have to put money to the only borrower left, which is the government. So that's why I think they're all, all buying government bonds, mm -hmm. and that's why bond yields have come down to these. But that means the government has to invest in ways where they get at least 2.6% return on public investment. Exactly. Know? And, but you know, if you've already got 24 rapid rail lines and only two of them are cash flow positive, where, are they, where will it go? Well, uh, that I think we better bring some brightest people in China into the uh, Okay, that's a fair question. <laughs> okay. And we'll force them to come out with anything that has a social rate of return higher than 2.6%. So that could be you know, improving education, uh, make sure a lot more people can speak English so that they can work around the world. Those things can have, you know, um, mm -hmm. social rate of return higher than 2.6%. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be all concrete, concrete. And, and so forth. I'll learn an awful lot of builders that want government support right now, I think. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so if I were the Chinese government, I will first use this, whatever the resources, the financial resources, to make sure that all of the fin uh, started projects that are not finished, and I understand that there are a lot of uh, housing projects that were started, oh, but yeah. still, no, no, right. They have enough empty apartments to house all of France. <laughs> yeah. 17 million empty apartments. So I, the first area that I would spend the money is to make sure that all the apartments that were started are actually finished. Yeah. I think that will have the biggest impact 
for the one RMB that yeah. you spend, mm -hmm. because then that will make people who put the money to uh, build those yeah. houses will, will be made whole, even though the price of the house may be not that high as they expected. But I think that's where the money should be spent mm -hmm. first. Okay. Lou, you, you, we've been talking about balance sheet recession, but that's, that's, that was your old book. This is your new book. <laughs> your new book is called Pursued Economy, Understanding and Overcoming the Challenging New Realities for Advanced Economies. It's a pursued economy. That's a strange term. Why don't you explain that? Well, uh, this came from my own experience, uh, upbringing, if I, if I may say so. I was born in Japan at, in 1954. Japan was still a very poor country, recovering from the devastation of war. And in 1967, when I was 13 years old, I moved to the United States, San Francisco to be precise. And the difference was, was just amazing. Everything was so beautiful in San Francisco compared to uh, Tokyo that was still struggling. Uh, <clears throat> but just 10 years after that, so many American companies began to be shut down by the Japanese companies uh, for cars, uh, household appliances, electronics, one after another. Semiconductors. Semiconductors. <laughs> so Japanese were chasing the Americans yep. themselves and were beating yep. in this, uh, winning in this battle. Then, uh, years later, same thing is happening to the Japanese companies. The Taiwanese, the South Koreans, and eventually Chinese companies are chasing Japanese companies. And so many of them, so many of the Japanese companies are now suffering or have disappeared already. So I was, and then, same thing was then happening in Taiwan. The Chinese companies are taking over a lot of industries that Taiwan used to dominate. So that's why I call this a pursued economy, being pursued by the people with younger workforce, hungry, lower wage cost, and <clears throat> doing the right things. I mean, having younger wor workforce and so forth doesn't guarantee you that you're gonna, your economy will, will be successful. You have to do all the right things. But so many countries are now doing the right things by putting in the necessary infrastructure and so forth so that companies from around the world will want to mm. set up factories there mm. or research institutes there. And then that's the pattern that I observe, which is why I call this. In, in, in your book, you, you really hinge a lot of your argument around something called the Lewis turning point. What is that? Ah, uh, okay. <clears throat> Lewis turning point, so, so I separate eco, uh, economic <clears throat> stages of economic development in three stages. The first stage is when most of the workers are still in the countryside. So industrialization has just begun. At that stage, all these surplus workers in the countryside will, will be moving into the cities. But because there are so many of them, the factory workers in the cities only have to pay very low wages and they could still collect a lot of work. So you have a lot of excess labor. Exactly. And eventually, when all the workers are absorbed, that point is called the Lewis turning point. And once that point is reached, then the labor supply curve start having this upward slope. And that is that if you want additional workers to come in, you have to pay higher wages. So. Before the Lewis turning point is one world. After you pass the Lewis turning point, it's the another world. So labor has pricing power. Yes, now stage. they have a bargain, bargaining power. They can bargain the for better wages. Employers. Yes, and the wages start rising rapidly. Once the wages start rising rapidly, and if you're the entrepreneur, the businessman, but you're still making lots of money, uh, you want to make sure that you invest to improve your productivity, because if you, if, you, if you don't improve your productivity, but wages keep on higher, then you, you lose your money. Profit. Yeah, exactly. But you also want to increase your capacity as well, because workers are now being paid a lot. So domestic demand start increasing very rapidly once you pass the Lewis turning point. Consumption start increasing rapidly. And so demand for your product also goes up. Your cost also goes up. So you increase your capacity, you increase your productivity, how do you do that? You borrow money to do it. So during the, this period, uh, I call the golden era, 
uh, companies are investing very heavily, borrowing heavily, household saving, companies borrowing. That's the economy we all learn in our universities. But that world does not last forever. Why? Because wages reach a certain point where businessmen start saying, hey, it's cheaper to build in Mexico, or let's move it to Southeast Asia, or China for that matter. Mm -hmm. And once that point is reached, then you enter a very different world all over again. Because now they don't have that much incentive to increase productivity at home when you can use workers at such low wages. So uh, 100, 100 million American workers are competing as 500 million Chinese workers. Exactly, that world. Mm -hmm. And that, once you reach that point where the return on capital is higher abroad in emer some emerging economies than at home, then I will argue that that economy has entered the pursued phase of economic development. And that's a very different world because household sector. How do you succeed in a pursued phase? We go back to the same fiscal issue, and that is that the key challenge of the economies in pursuit phase is that household sector is still saving money as they used to, like the last 5,000 years. Because we still worry about our old age, we still want to save some money. So that part hasn't changed. <laughs> but the companies that used to borrow those funds are no longer borrowing money because they rather borrow and invest in Mexico, or Southeast Asia, then you need that currency, not the US dollar. So that then becomes somewhat like balance sheet recession all over again. Household sector saving money, corporate sector not borrowing money. And if he, even if central bank bring rates down to zero, the uh, difference in wages are so large that a few percentage point changes in the interest rate at home doesn't make all that much difference mm -hmm. as, as before. In a golden era, when most of the factories are at home, and you know, some changes in interest rates could affect the cost of capital and, all the, and that will affect the uh, saving investing behavior. But once you're in the pursuit phase, where most of the investments are done elsewhere, I'm afraid monetary policy also loses its effectiveness for, for that reason. That You've not used the term tariffs or import restrictions or, you know, I mean, the kind of tools that appear to be popular right now in our narrative in Washington. Uh, are, are they inappropriate? Are they wrong? Are they not big enough? What's, uh, how do you feel about this effort to try to drive up the price of imports so that people want to manufacture in the U.S. again? Well, I think some of these uh, changes from uh, urbanization to golden age to pursued economy this is inevitable. Uh, try to maintain, for example, our textile industry in the United States. It's going to be very, very difficult, no, mat no matter what. Uh, but my view, and that was explained in chapter nine of this book, that has gone a little too far. And I'm very worried about this development. And I, I think I, it went too far because we understood, we economists understood free trade incorrectly. Free trade, of course, helped the global uh, economy massively, absolutely massively. Uh, and of course, helped the United States as well. But there is this notion in free trade that said, free trade creates both winners and losers in the same economy. But the gain of the winners are always greater than the, lo the losses, loss of the losers. So on a net basis, economy always does better with free trade. That's what we were taught in universities, if you remember. Mm -hmm. But the professors never told us that for that condition to be true, the trade has to be either in balance or in surplus. Because just imagine if your trade is in huge deficit, that your factories are closing all over, people are losing jobs. And if you calculate GDP, for example, Trade surplus is added to the GDP when you're calculating GDP. Trade deficit is subtracted from the GDP. So running a trade deficit means your GDP is lower than otherwise. And U.S. have run this trade deficit, have run this trade deficit for 40 years. So the number of people who consider themselves losers of free trade in the United States, I'm afraid, has grown massively. 
Many of them are losers. And many of them are losers. Yeah. It's not just perception of it. It's actually yeah. losers. Yeah. And I think that's why starting 2016, when Trump, Mr. Trump got elected, he only had really one agenda, right? Reduce the trade deficit. Mm. Let's protect the uh, manufacturing industries. And all these blue-collar workers who have been suffering for all these years voted enthusiastically for Mr. Trump for for pretty good reason. Because that was not, people were not helping the uh, blue-collar workers in the previous administrations as enthusiastically as Mr. Trump at that, at that point. And if you remember Hillary Clinton, when he was, she was nominated to become the president. Uh, she was protectionist. Yeah, she, was, she had to say she's not going to join the TPP. Yeah. Which she herself negotiated. Yeah. And the whole arena of the Democratic National Convention was filled with a sign that says no to TPP. That was the only sign that was on the arena. So we have going protectionists because we did not look after the workers and the manufacturing industries mm. for so long by allowing the dollar to remain too high. Originally, when this uh, GATT system was put into place after World War II, General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, that was the beginning of the free trade uh, post-war. The idea was that if there's a big uh, changes, when, when there's a big imbalance in trade, exchanges should be adjusted eventually. Those are fixed rate exchanges, but those, those are supposed to be adjusted if there's a big uh, imbalances. And uh, 1990, 1971, with Nixon shock, there was moved to a flexible exchange rate. So exchange rate adjusting every day to minimize the uh, increase in uh, trade balances. That is to say, the uh, trade surplus countries will eventually see its exchange rate rise, trade deficit countries eventually see its uh, exchange rates fall, and that was basically a balancing act. But starting 1980, all these countries, without thinking very thoroughly, decide to deregulate the capital flows. So before 1980, only exporters and importers were in the foreign exchange market, basically. Mm -hmm. And so if exporters have, for example, Japanese exporters, Toyota, earn so much dollars in the United States, have to sell these dollars to pay their workers at home in yen. But the Americans are not selling very many goods in Japan on the other side. So they are only selling so, so little yen. Toyota needs so much uh, uh, Japanese yen to pay their workers. Then naturally the price of yen will go higher and higher. That's how it's supposed to work. But then after 1980, capital flows were allowed to enter the foreign exchange market. These guys then dominated the market completely. Today, about 95% of the trade that goes on in the foreign exchange market is basically uh, these financial types. Financial right? capital flows yes. for investments, yeah. And importers and exporters, only 5%. Mm -hmm. So these guys are dominating the exchange rate and they're pushing the dollar higher and higher because they think this is an exciting place to be. Mm -hmm. But that, that is at the cost of our manufacturing base, our workers uh, in those industries. And we allow that to go on for too long. So and we that, need a weaker dollar now? I believe so. Uh, it's a towering dollar now. Yes, yes, yes. So it has to be brought down gradually. Mm. I mean, if you try to do that all at once, you know, our financial market might collapse. Mm -hmm. But it has to be adjusted. It has to be looked at instead of being ignored. Another palace accord? I think something, Plaza Accord 1985, that was also put in place to protect free trade because uh, by September 1985, when the Plaza Accord was put in place, protectionist pressure in, in this town was so bad that it was said that there was only two companies that were, because the dollar was so strong, uh, there was only two countries left in the United States for free trade, Boeing and Coca-Cola. Remember that? <laughs> Everyone else was against free trade. So then President Reagan, using Treasury Secretary James Baker, brought the thing down, mm -hmm. and then that problem was resolved. Mm -hmm. But then, after that, the dollar was allowed to strengthen gradually again, and by the time Mr. Trump got elected, dollar was almost all-time all mm -hmm. high, and that's why we, we got all these problems that 
uh, that all this protection, this mm. pressure is coming out. Well, sure, if I could go back on this, your pursuit economy, because you say that, you know, workers overseas are available much cheaper, people want to invest there. How does technology change? Because during this period when American workers lost opportunity and manufacturing went overseas, also was at a time when we were shifting from a physical economy to a virtual economy. Lots more American income today is derived from virtual things, digital mm -hmm. commerce. What, how, how do you deal with that? Well, that actually made outsourcing so much more easier. Mm. Right before, if you want to call your factory manager in Mexico or Vietnam, yeah, you had to send a phone call. Yeah, a huge, extremely expensive. Try to send some drawings and this and that back and forth. You have to use your fax machine if you have that. Those are very expensive. I mean, communication costs are very expensive. Now the technology is such that you can do all of these things almost free. And I think that has a, that played a huge role in accelerating, accelerating the loss of jobs. The loss of jobs. But, but it also transforms economies. I mean, it, isn't the only way to really advance now is with technological advance? Don't we have to invent new ideas if we're going to try to, we've got, we, how are we going to compete? Well, that part of highly educated people with great ideas, of course they should continue doing what they're doing best. But in the same country, we have a lot of people who didn't have the opportunity on education that That's we true. did. That's right. And these people still need to be looked after. And these are the people who are becoming the losers. They were the double time. losers. Yep. Yes, yes. And it didn't have to be, I mean, there will be always losers, mm. but it didn't have to be this many losers if we were more careful with the exchange rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some sense, Mr. Trump managed to deliver what he promised. I hate to say this, but he kept on talking about trade deficit almost every day during his presidency. That kind of scared the capital flows people who put money in the dollar, which pushed the dollar higher and higher from investing in the United States. And that kept the dollar from appreciating during his four-year term. So if you look at uh, yen dollar rate during that four-year term, Federal Reserve raised interest rates nine times during the four-year period. Yen dollar rate did not move at all. Mm -hmm. Stay within 115 to 120 or something like that. That's the kind of thing government can still do. And when Mr. Biden came along, he's supposed to be for labor unions, he's supposed to be for uh, blue collar workers, but he stopped talking about the trade deficit. And look where the dollar is today. So I would really wish that Mr. Biden will also talk about trade deficit from time to time mm -hmm. to keep those investors who think they can move the exchange rate from uh, becoming too too confident mm -hmm. that the dollar could go down. I mean, if the President of the United States came out strongly against uh, our trade deficit, then naturally the Japanese or German or Arab investors holding U.S. treasuries will start saying, well, maybe the dollar would, could fall and maybe we shouldn't ex yeah. expose ourselves too much to it. You know? And that will allow the trade part to play a bigger role in uh, um, mm -hmm. exchange rate determination. And I think that will keep the U.S. trade deficit from, from increasing. Let me ask you, is, is China entering the phase of being a pursued economy? We hear about supply chains moving away from China. Well, if you look at, uh, if I may use this chart, course, this chart shows where these countries are in this uh, category that I mentioned urbanization state, golden era, and the pursuit phase. And uh, if you look at this chart, you'll notice that the golden era part, this uh, orange part, seems to be coming shorter and shorter mm. for the countries. That's because of the of technology. Globalization, globalization and technology that uh, 
U.S. and Western Europe probably enjoy for 50, 60 years. Japan, maybe 40. Taiwan and South Korea, maybe 20, 25. And China may could be shorter because so many other countries want the factories from China. Now that Chinese wages have gone up and because of the, the conflict with the West, well, uh, making products in China could could be risky if other countries stop putting tariffs on the Chinese well, products. Well, then, then the Chinese government is making it harder. I mean, with the yes. anti-espionage laws and other right, things. Right, right, so, right. Causing people. But it's also because of this demographic decline now in China. They're probably, you know, coming to that point where they don't, I mean, they still have a lot of unemployed people, mm -hmm. uh, but that's really kind of this recession, this balance sheet recession now, right? I mean, China doesn't have to be in the position it is in now. I mean, there are a lot of things that Chinese government can do to encourage people to invest more, expand more mm -hmm. factories, because Chinese companies are still highly competitive. Yeah. But the current government doesn't seem to put too much priority on those things. There are a lot more... Uh, concentrated on national security issues. Yeah, yeah. And no. that may actually shorten the period of- The golden era. Golden era for the Chinese mm -hmm. economy. Mm -hmm. Prematurely, in my view. It yeah. doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. We're, we're at nearing the end of time we have with your version. What, what, so why don't, why don't you take a minute to just frame up kind of, what's your message to Washington, to policymakers here? What should we be doing here? Well, I wrote this book, Pursued Economy, to uh, make people think that the economics we learn in universities are no longer applicable in the world we live in now. Mm. We always assume the private sector is maximizing profits. And even though that is true, if the factories are all outside the country, they behave very, very differently. In the past, uh, with all the factories at home, interest rate movement at home made all the difference in the world. But if all the factories are outside, interest rate movements at home are not going to be very effective. And if you look at those uh, companies on its own, uh, their, their domestic operation, they're not borrowing money. But the household sector is still saving money. So in that case, the government might have to come in and the government just as you mentioned in the Chinese case, we'll have to bring in a lot of bright people in one room to come up with what we can do to make sure that the economy stays, uh, uh, keep on, keeps on going with a fiscal stimulus, but not wasting this money on some senseless projects. And in the pursued economy, right now we have a slightly different uh, headwind from this inflation coming from the uh, after effects of COVID-19. But once this inflation problem is behind us, rates will probably come down again. And so people have to think of what kind of projects will earn a social rate of return that is higher than the 10-year government at U.S. Treasury bonds. <clears throat> In your book, you talk about education. Sorry? You talk about education. And one of, one of them is definitely yeah. education. It's going to be. A... One of the key issues of our pursued economy is that education becomes so much more important than during the golden era. Yeah. During the golden era, it's usually the manufacturers that are yeah. uh, creating the jobs. And manufacturing jobs does not require very high levels of education. But in the pursued economy, uh, if you're not well educated, I'm afraid, you know, yeah. jobs are not available to you. So I think a lot more money should be spent. We have to education. up our game on this. Yeah. Yes. Richard Kuh, this has been a fascinating conversation with you. I, you uh, having, I think all of the people in the room, I'd ask you to thank him with your applause. And we want to say, you're a day couple of you. It, uh, Pursued Economy. It's available from Wiley, and I encourage everybody to get a copy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that.